They're going to release those balloons. Everybody in the community can celebrate with us. The rising of Christ. That's what we will celebrate. And I look forward to having you join with me as we put that together. If I haven't met you yet, my name is Phil Dix. I'm the pastor here at the Colfax United Methodist Church. I am glad to have you here today. I've already had a number of services. This is number 12 service in the last week that I've been able to put together. So I'm excited. This is Easter because I get to go eat after this with my family. Speaking of my family, I want to introduce them real quickly. Y'all want to stand up there? So we see, that's my wife, Connie. So my daughter, Carla, and Savannah, my granddaughter, and Calhoun, who's right there. And those guys are all connected with the guy up here on guitar. This is my son-in-law, Mark. And uh, I'm glad to have him uh, do that. Uh, Mark started playing guitar when, uh, I think right before we went to Jordan Creek or maybe something, but uh, Jordan Creek in West Des Moines. And uh, he got to try there and it worked out well. And he's been doing it ever since. And so a full-time job is a guitar player. His part-time job is he's superintendent of schools at uh, Woodward, Woodward Granger. Thank you very much. <laughs> Before that, in Decorah and Urbandale and all, kind of all kinds of places he's been. So I'm glad to have him here today. Mark is my son-in-law. I don't say that about many people. That's the reason, because I only have my daughter, but nonetheless, he's my son-in-law, and I love it. Because I tried Mark out when we first met him. Um, Mark worked for me one summer at Lake Okoboji, uh, United Methodist Camp, and uh, Mark was there to do my thing, and I thought to myself, I'm keeping my eyes on you. I want to know what this guy was really like, you know. So I brought him on staff, and I remember one day we were sitting around the fireplace there, and we were having all these kids. He was the director of one of the kids' groups, and so I said, draw a picture of a time when you felt God very real to you. And... Uh, Everybody was drawing their little groups. And I thought, I'm going to get close to Mark and see what he does. So go over to Mark. And Mark got his crayons out. And he's drawing a picture and everything else. And everybody's holding up the picture and saying, this is a time when God was real to me. I was in a car accident or whatever. whatever. Their kids are all showing. <clears throat> Mark holds up this picture of this girl, kind of a string girl, with blonde hair. And I thought, what is that? <laughs> An old girlfriend? I mean, and said, this is how I know God loves me, because of Carla. And I'm going to marry her. And I thought, you are a keeper. <laughs> you are a keeper. He passed the test. And since then, Mark and I, we've kind of hung out and doing all kinds of stuff. We go fishing up in Canada. We do that kind of stuff. Just got back from the Virgin Islands, going down there. And the two of us, we partied a lot. You know, kind of <laughs> pastor party. Can you believe that? <laughs> anyway, we had a great time. And uh, we're glad to be here as part of that whole experience. Mark's going to play for me today, play guitar. And I'm glad to make that happen. Uh, you get to meet the other side of the family, etc. Also, I want to thank my dear friend Cheryl, who had been practicing day and night uh, to get here to play this morning. And it's a great gift, and I thank her for doing that. And Linda introduced it, and everybody else who's involved in so many things. Ben and back there on the electronics and all that stuff. I just have to do that acknowledgement once a year, so there's my acknowledgement. <laughs> anyway, I want to welcome you to this. This is Easter Sunday. Imagine this. This is the Sunday when we celebrate uh, what Easter is all about. Now, I say that to you because... Uh, one of the things that I celebrate today is the fact that uh, you and I need to have something to take from this place today. And so many times we come, we celebrate Easter, you know, but sometimes we come for a reason and a purpose. Uh, and it's not by accident that we're here. And I say that to you because one of the things that I think is important to do as a clergy or a pastor is to give you a, a framework of what I think Easter is all about. And you can accept it or not. When Jesus found himself uh, being questioned by the scribes and Pharisees, the very people who later would drive the nails in his hands of accusations, found himself uh, having an opportunity to uh, speak to them when they were asked the question, what is the greatest commandment? Tell me, what's the great thing that we're supposed to be doing? And Jesus, like says this, the great Shema of the Hebrew, and it's love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. I'll say it more time. Love, love, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. But he didn't put a period there. And while everybody was going, yeah, 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 we know, he goes, wait a minute, there's another that's like it. And it is, love your neighbor, said Jesus. And he didn't put a period there. So some people said to him, who's my neighbor? I love this. And Jesus says, Who's sitting next to you? That's your neighbor. Look who's sitting next to you today. See that person? Have you loved that person yet? Well, maybe you haven't, but if not, work on it. You know, have to. But that's the love part of it. Jesus said, you know, love your neighbor. 
For God so loved the world, he sent Jesus into the world. See, this is all about what is Easter all about. But then instead of putting a period there, Jesus said this, love the Lord your God, let your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Love your neighbor. And then he goes on, he says, oh, but one more. Love your neighbor as you love yourself. Period. For a couple thousand years, we've been trying to figure that out. You see, I think what's prescriptive to the world today is that one of the things we need is just to know we're loved. Think about it. Uh, some of you may be there. Some of you may be past that. But I think it's critically important to realize that on Easter, one of the things I want you to leave here with is an affirmation that you are loved. Maybe by the person sitting next to you, maybe by a stranger, maybe somebody who just treats you nice or kindly. But I think it's critically important that you and I know that because if we do not know we are loved, we will go searching and will not find it. And therefore, we will not be part of that sharing, as Christ calls us, of that love to the world. <laughs> What's wrong with the world today? There are people who are searching for love and there are others who just don't know their love because we have just not experienced our Christianity as servanthood. What does it mean to serve them? Jesus came for the down and out, for the outlaws and the outsiders. That's who he came for. That's us. Yay! <laughs> so Easter becomes for us a way to know that we are loved and that we are cared for. And that's why we have a hope. A hope that says when those who die, we will believe we see them again. And our hearts will rejoice that no one will take that joy from us. That's Easter. And the scripture reminds us of that over and over again. It may not mean anything to you yet, but as you get a little older every once in a while, you say, I just like to know I get a second round on this. And I get to see those people that I love and I care for and put together. As I got ready to leave the house yesterday, and this morning my wife said to me, your father would like it if you'd wear a tie and a suit. I said, do you know how many years it's been since I've worn a tie and a suit professionally? But I put one on today for my father who died when he was 60 years old and is in heaven, but is looking down upon us, just like all your folks are too. That's what we celebrate at the end of the day. Yet though we die, we shall rise again. That's what it's all about. But that's the word we want to share. Do you have an announcement, I'm sorry, that you want to make here? We're glad to have Doug here with us today. This is uh, Doc Skidmore who asked uh, an announcement be made. His friend, uh, Reverend Robert Cook, turns 80 on their celebrating his uh, birthday on April 15th. There's an informational uh, bulletin or a note that's actually tacked on the wall on a bulletin board just to come in on the steps. But um, this gentleman's very, been very, very active um, in building homes uh, in El Salvador, helping other people uh, his whole life. And Doc really wanted people to, to know about this. And there's information on that about how you can actually donate to, to what he does. So do take a stop and take a minute to look at that and take a minute to, to do that. The only other uh, announcement would be to remind people that as much as I enjoy doing liturgy, you should too. <laughs> and actually uh, taking ownership and being part of the service is a lot more enjoyable when you stop and think about it than just being a spectator. So, Any other announcements that people want to be made? Tom? Yeah, we're talking about signing up. Uh, there's still a little room on the lawnmower sign up sheet. Anything else? Thank you, John. As part of our Easter service, uh, we always have an opportunity for the reading of memorials that have been given to the church in the last year. And uh, I'd like to invite you to come up and to share with us the reading of those who have passed and the memorial gifts that have been given. Good morning. And thank you all for coming and joining us in our Easter service. We are going to have a time of remembrance, and we want to thank those people that have given Easter lilies or have given monetary gifts in memory of their loved ones. Bob and Rhonda Davidson, in memory of Robert and Eunice Davidson. Eileen Berger, in memory of Lois Schmidt and Robert Schmidt. Kevin and Kim Lang, Carson and Camden, in memory of Mary Lang. Matt and Teresa Fadley, <coughs> Benjamin and Daniel, in memory of Raymond Anderson. 
Pastor Phil and Connie Dix, in memory of Cecil and Norma Dix, and in memory of John Mark Dix. Bruce and Diana Fadley, in memory of Ye and Mary Hunter. Tom Bowen, in memory of Bobby Bowen. Marvin and Marcia Rohrbaugh, in memory of John and Elder Rohrbaugh, and Clifton and Betty Gwen. Kim Beard, in memory of Willard, Eleanor, and Missy Douglas. Teresa Fadley, other Teresa Fadley. Rich and Donna Boyd. Bevan and Jen Everett, Adeline and Grace, in memory of Floyd Everett and Juanita Grimm. Dwayne and Cheryl Skidmore, Merritt and Wanda Skidmore, Roger and Miriam Gast. Paul and Linda Walter, to all the parents and siblings gone before us. Karen Cross, in memory of Doug Cross, Royal and Frieda Cross, and Carol and Kathleen White. Those are people who have given the beautiful Easter lilies. For the monetary memorials, Virginia Hunter and Pam Hunter, in memory of Harold Hunter and Kristen Fish. Jim and Norma Jean Warnock, Donnie and Jeanette Rome, in memory of John and Mamie Warnock, Reverend Wayne and Adeline Hahn, and Jennifer Crozier. Nancy Holdifer, Jeremy and Jonathan Holdifer, in memory of Jim and Helen Thomas, and Ron Holdifer. Thank you to all of you. sections under the yellow. Here we go. Our long journey through the darkness is over. Our hearts are leaping and dancing in the light of Jesus' resurrection. No more do we need to fear. No more do we feel that we are alone. Hallelujah. Jesus is alive. Jesus is alive in our hearts and in our church. Can you feel the excitement of being alive in Christ? Hallelujah. That's the word. Hallelujah. Praise and joy together. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Hallelujah. I invite you to stand as we join together in singing the first verse of the hymn, Easter People Raise Your Voices, hymn number 308. 308. Easter people raise your voices around the First and foremost, it means that we serve a risen Savior. 
The grave could not hold Christ. He defeated death. He paid the price for our sins of his own blood, and the consequences for us are huge. Let's join in singing the chorus, Because He Lives. Because He lives, I can face tomorrow. Because He lives, all fear is gone. Because I Because Christ lives, we will live too, both in this life and the life to come. Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me will live, even though they die, and whoever lives by believing in me will never die. I am the one who raises the dead and gives them life again. Anyone who believes in me, even though they die, like anyone else, shall live again. Let's join in singing that chorus once again. Because he lives, I can face tomorrow. Because he lives, all fear is gone. Because I know he holds a future, and life is worth the living just because he lives. The message of Easter was first spoken to two women in the tomb. In these simple words, do not be afraid, for he is risen. Jesus is with us and gives us the ability to overcome any defeat. That doesn't mean that we have a way to remove ourselves from that, but in the midst of it, we understand that Christ is with us as we mature and grow in our faith and the ways of loving and dealing with one another. The true Christian realizes that with Christ, we rise above every setback, every obstacle, enter into that true meaning of living for he lives. Let's sing the chorus one more time. Because he lives, I can face tomorrow. Because he lives, all fear is gone. Because I know he holds the future. And life is worth the living just because he The message of Easter tells us, you need not be afraid of anything, not life with all its insecurities, its conflicts, its uncertainties, not afraid of even death itself. You need have no fear, no fear. When your spirit is filled with the unshakable strength of God in the name of Jesus Christ, you get faith so deeply planted within you that when crisis hits you, you automatically can look life in the face and not be afraid. You can say the Apostle Paul, for I am look, <clears throat> for I am convinced that what neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Jesus Christ our Lord. Say it together with me. Easter is here. Be transformed. Be resurrected, be not afraid. One of the traditional songs of Easter is the song, Christ the Lord is Risen Today. A few years ago, I invited some kids to come in to ring some bells during that time. Uh, I, thought it was so, so I thought, we'll try it again this year. So far, it's worked in every church service, so I wanted to bring the bells here. I think I have some volunteers, right? Are they leaving? All the kids, come on up. Are they coming? There they go. Very good. Come on down, grab a bell. We're going to stand and we're going to sing this song. So I invite you to stand if you would. Turn to hymn number 302. Christ the Lord is risen today. And we'll be singing verses 1, 2, 3, and 4. Would you stand, please, as we join together in singing? Christ the Lord is risen today. Christ the Lord is risen today.
greet one another. You can move from the pews and welcome one another to our service together. <laughs> And uh, so this right here. And then inside I've got this one. Do you know what this is? Temple. It's the temple, right. It's the tabernacle. And, and the reason it's important, because when Jesus uh, found himself uh, finishing up with the you know palm branches and all of that, the next day he went to the temple and he said to them, you know 
what? Instead of just being a house of prayer, you guys are doing some things that maybe you shouldn't do. So he said, you need to clean up your act. And they didn't really care to hear Jesus say that to them. But Jesus said, nonetheless, you need to get back to the fact that this is uh, this is worshiping about God. It's all focused on God. So that's what that one's about. Okay. So there's another egg inside. And this one is what? I'm part. And this story reminds us of what went on um, in, in Tuesday. Uh, and Tuesday, Jesus went back to the temple and he started preaching, talking about, you know, love the Lord your God, all serve mind and strength, love your neighbor, you love yourself, you know, those kinds of things. That took place on Tuesday. Then on Wednesday, we have this one. And on Wednesday, this little egg, it looks a little strange, but what it does, it talks about uh, a pot full of silver, and that was the record of when Jesus was betrayed uh, by a guy named Judas, and uh, said that Jesus is the guy, and I want you to arrest him, and there's what Jesus looks like. He's right there. And I'll give him a kiss, and that way you'll know. Now that took place on Wednesday. Then, on Thursday, we have this one, which is... is, is that's right. The last supper. The last supper. That's what that was about. And what did we do for the last supper here on Thursday? Yes. It was like a mirror. You were all disciples. Yeah, you're all disciples. This whole table was set up like the like Leonardo da Vinci's picture. And some of you were disciples. Well, all of you were disciples. And then Tom back there was Jesus. And then what we did was we reenacted it with the living uh, supper. So each one of you talked about the fact that you were a disciple and how you first found Jesus and followed Jesus. And then Leonardo da Vinci painted that picture at what was called the most critical time. That's when Jesus said, some of you, if one of you is going to betray me, and they all said, I. He said, I, he said, I, right, that's what they said. And so that was the painting of Jesus at that particular point. So that's what we reckon. But the, the Passover meal that we celebrate from Monday Thursday was really Holy Communion, what we normally celebrate. The bread and the wine, that's what Jesus celebrated with his disciples, and he says, as often as you do it, remember to me. So there we go. Right. Now, I got another one. Now this one, you know what this is? Cross. Well, yes. Yeah, he was hanging on the cross. So that's what this story is about. It's about the cross and about Jesus hanging on the cross. And that took place on what we call Good Friday. Okay? Very good. Excellent. And then he was buried on Saturday. Now, last week, I stopped right here. Because this is the egg. Do you know what this is supposed to represent? Yes. The stone, right, that was in front of the tomb. Like, we've got a stone in the tomb here. And a little bit later, you're going to actually run through that, that part with us. Okay? So you make that happen. So that's what this was, was a, was a stone. And, and this was a really critical, important story because this talked about the fact that the stone was rolled away from the tomb. So you want to know what's in here? And I'm going to give you the honor of actually opening up and seeing what's in the last one. Are you ready? Open it up. Oh yeah, just like Jesus' is tomb, right? Yeah, there is that big one. There is? What? Oh yeah, see, there, there it is. I knew it was there somewhere. What? No. It was right there. I saw it, it was right in there. It's kind of squished in there, but who is this? The Jesus, you know? The whole thing, you know? And the Jesus piece? And that's right. So, why I want to tell you this was, because I wanted you to know that one of the great symbols of the Christian faith also is the tomb. And we're going to take up an offering in a minute and do some other stuff, but what we're going to do is we're going to take an opportunity to actually have you portray the parts of the story and share it with us. And we're going to have you do it with your puppets. We've been doing a lot of stuff with puppets. Like Monday Thursday, we had you guys here and the puppets were here actually going through their thing. And we're going to do the same thing with you today. But before I do that, I want to show you what I did. A couple of weeks ago, I decided I always give something for Easter. I thought, what would I give him for Easter? And I thought, you know what I'm going to give him? <clears throat> One of the great symbols of Easter itself. And I bought some of these. Do you know what this is? A rock. Right? It's a rock. <laughs> That's right. What else do you think it might be? A tomb. A tomb, right, like the one we've got here. 
And I saw these and I thought, I'll get one of these tombs. And when I did, I was surprised because you know what it has on the other side? An open tomb. Just like the tomb. Jesus has risen. Jesus is no longer dead. But this is a great way of talking about what our faith is all about. That we believe that when people die, that they'll live again. We believe that Jesus loves us. That's why he died for us. This is the important thing, is that Jesus says, that, you know what? I come alive. And as soon as I come alive, I go out and I start finding my disciples and others. And I start telling them, I'm alive. And you know what? You'll be alive too. Not only in this life, in the life to come. That's the celebration. That's what Easter is all about. So in order to help you with that, I decided what I was going to do was to find a Jesus to put with me. So I looked in the catalog and I found a Jesus and the Jesus was about this tall. And I thought everybody should have a Jesus about this tall. That's what you need for Easter, okay? So I sit in and I said, I'd like to get uh, 50, 50 Jesuses because we're going to all the churches. I gotta make sure I got enough Jesus to put together. So as we put it together, guess what? I got a box that came to me about this big, about this thick, and on it it said, 50 Jesuses. That's what I said, what? 50 Jesuses? There's not room in here for one Jesus. I called them up and I said, what's the deal here? And they said, well, that's what the picture was. Yeah, but that picture looked about this tall. And then Jesus says, and they said, well, I'm sorry, but that's what we got. And I opened it up, and these were those Jesuses inside. They weren't like the big ones I wanted. But you know what? The tomb, and I put the Jesus next to it. Do you think this is good? Do you think this is good? That's right. Jesus is almost taller than the tomb, but they still kind of sneak in there and get him into the tomb. Bring that kind of thing. So, I love it when you have an opportunity to take something like this home with you and to use it. If you could tell a story about Jesus being in the tomb and then on Easter rising again and there's Jesus. You might even put Jesus in your pocket. That's where I keep mine sometimes. Oops. It's right here. I got Jesus in my pocket. So I have one of these for each one of you and I want to make sure that you get it. Okay? So if you'd like to help me pass these out, would you have me? I want to make sure that you each get one. But in fact, I'm in a very generous mood today. I want you to take two of them. Now, you ask me why, Pastor Bill, would you have me take two of these? Because I think it's always important to give one away to another person. So if somebody comes and asks you about it, you may decide, this is a person I'd like to give one. Would you like one of these to take with you? And they may say yes. You say, here, I have a gift to make you and beg it together. So make sure you all have two of those. Okay, we need some extra over here. Yep, they both need seconds. There you go. Very good, guys. Hold on to them. You've all got one? Very good. Excellent. Very good. Okay. So we're going to have you come back in a minute and portray the story for us. But before we do that, we're going to take an offering that we always do, and we'll have you help us with the offering. But let's do a prayer before we do it. Let's pray together. God, I give you thanks for every one of the boys and girls here. And I just pray you'll send angels to surround them and watch over them. You'll pick us up and carry us at times. you give us an opportunity to know that we are loved. Jesus loves us, as I know, for the Bible tells me so. The little ones to him, Lord, they're weak, but he is strong. Yes, Jesus loves me. God, I pray that the love of Christ may surround each one of us. Protect us, lift us up, carry us, and allow us to know that we are loved in an everlasting love. For this we pray in your name. And everybody said, Amen. Thank you. We're going to move to our offering now, so I'll have the kids pick up your plates if you want to, service, and I'll see you back up in front.
Would you stand? Praise God, brother. upon this altar. Signs and symbols of who we are, what we have received and now given back to you. Bless both gift and giver, we pray. We seek to increase the opportunity for us to be your witnesses in the world, serving others, and loving and caring for one another. This we ask in your holy name. And everyone said, Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. A friend of mine uh, was asked the question, how are you coming on your Easter message? And the response that she made was, I'm having a terrible time trying to come up with the perfect Easter message. Somehow, it's just not clicking. And this is a big day. i got to make sure the sermon is really good. Her friend said to her, he said, you remember when we were in homiletics class and uh, we were teaching about how to preach? And, and he reminded us, the professor did, that he said, on Easter, there's only one thing you really need to do for a message. He said, what's that? He said, just tell the story. Just tell the story. If you're around at Christmas time, you know that our kids told the story back to us. And it's critically important that the next generation continues to tell that story and what that story is all about. But it's important for us to tell the story. Why? Because a lot of us know the Easter story, either because we've read it, we've heard it, or we saw the movie, whatever it might be for you. But in reality, the Easter story itself is contained in Scripture three times. It comes to us, first of all, from the book of Matthew and then Luke and the book of John. Each one of the disciples found themselves witnessing the actual resurrection of Jesus. And when they returned and later, they each had an input of what they saw in the Easter story that was important for them. Now, the reason I say that to you is because each of us, I believe, have gone through many life experiences. You may be one of those experiences now. You've either found yourself enjoying, or, or you find yourself sorrowful, or you find yourself some demand that's made on your life, a question about future or where you're going as part of that. We all have a variety of experiences, good days, bad days, whatever it may be. And yet with that, each one of us has a certain filter that we use. We become sensitized to certain things. People say things and suddenly we take on a new demeanor. It means something important to us because we've been through those rocky times. Or maybe you and I have just given up in the world and somebody comes along and says what are you doing and you think oh you want to know what i'm doing i'll tell you what i'm doing all that begins to impact our lives by the experiences that we had the same was true with the disciples when each one went to the tomb to see what was going on whether the resurrection of jesus or somebody had taken the body each one of them came out of, a, out of an opportunity of living them they'd been behind closed doors they'd seen jesus die they'd watched him been buried there were people who felt like everything had fallen apart. There was nothing left. Some of them even forgot the fact that he said three days later he would rise again. That each one were impacted in a way that they decided to write that story down. That same story we have 2,000 years later. So rather than I trying to preach a message to you, I'm going to share with you today, Doug and I, the three stories that are found in Scripture. In your bulletin today, you have a piece of paper that's folded which shows each one of those stories. And I placed it there so that you could see it. When Doug reads his in a moment, he's going to ask you to actually read with him those particular stories. Because these are the stories by Matthew, Luke, and John that may contain something you and I have not heard before. Or maybe in the hearing, something you hear begins to apply to you and your life. It may be something you've never heard before, like the earthquake that took place the morning of the service itself, Jesus rose from the dead. So I want to invite you to join with us as we follow through on those. We'll be singing again a song in between each of those readings. But first, uh, let's join together as we hear the reading of that first Easter story that took place, this time coming to us from the book of Matthew. Oh, I'm sorry, I'll read the first one for you. <laughs> From Matthew 28. After the Sabbath, as the first light of the new week dawned, Mary Magdalene. You all know Mary Magdalene? 
Mary Magdalene was the prostitute. She was the person that Jesus had picked up on that other side of life. No one paid much attention to Mary. Mary was the one that he rescued and gave the opportunity by rescuing a friendship, by listening, by being there with her. But that's what Jesus was. He hung out with the outcasts. He hung out with the outsiders. And Mary was one of those people. In fact, Mary was one of the people that was with him when no others were at the cross. Mary was there. She responded to the love that Jesus had given to her. And that love was so important that she wanted to be there. And therefore, she was the first to come to the tomb. And Mary came to keep vigil at the tomb. And suddenly the earth reeled and rocked under her feet as God's angel came down from heaven. Came right up to where they were standing. And he rolled the stone and then sat on it. Shafts of lightning blazed from him. His garments shimmered snow white. The guards at the tomb were scared to death. They were so frightened that they couldn't move. And the angel spoke to the women, the three women, the only that were there. The other men were behind the doors. They were afraid they were locked in, but they came to the tomb. There's nothing to fear, the angel said. I know you're looking for Jesus, the one they nailed to the cross. But he is not here. He was raised, just as he said. Come and look at the place. Where he was. Now get on your way quickly and go tell his disciples he is risen from the dead. He's going on ahead of you into Galilee and you will see him there. That is the message to give to the other disciples. The women, deep in wonder and full of joy, lost no time in leaving the tomb and they ran to tell the disciples. Then Jesus met them, stopping them in their tracks. Good morning, he said, and they fell to their knees and embraced his feet and worshiped him. And Jesus said, you're holding on to me for dear life. Don't be frightened like that. I'm not leaving you again. I'll be with you always. Go tell the brothers that they are to go to Galilee, that place where they started the ministry altogether. And I will meet them there. Let's join in singing the first verse of Easter Cup. See the tomb where death had laid him, empty now its mouth declares. Death and we could not contain him, for the throne of life he shares. Come and worship, come and worship, worship Christ the risen King. The second reading is from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 24, verses 1 through 12. On the first day of the week, very early in the morning, the women took the spices they had prepared and went to the tomb. They found the stone rolled away from the tomb, but when they entered, they did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. While they were wondering about this, suddenly two men in clothes that gleamed like lightning stood before beside them. In their fright, the women bowed down with their faces to the ground. But the men said to them, Why do you look for the living among the dead? He is not here. He has risen. Remember how he, he told you while he was still with you in Galilee. The Son of Man must be delivered over to the hands of sinners, be crucified, and on the third day be raised again. Then they remembered his words. When they came back from the tomb, they told all these things to the eleven and to all the others. It was Mary Magdalene, Joanna, Mary the mother of James, and the others with them who told this to the apostles. But they did not believe the women, because their words seemed to be to, to them like nonsense. Peter, however, got up and ran to the tomb. Bending over, he saw the strips of linen lying by themselves. And he went away, wondering to himself what had happened. Let's join together in singing that second verse. <laughs> Rise, O church, and lift your voices. Christ has conquered death and hell. Sing as all the earth rejoices. Resurrection and the spell. Come and worship, come and worship. Worship Christ the risen King. The last witness of the resurrection came from the apostle whose name was John. If you remember the portrait by Leonardo da Vinci, John is that person whose hands are folded and leaning closest to Jesus as Jesus was leaning closer to him. 
John had a great love for Jesus, and Jesus had a great love for John. It was that love that caused him when John lost a good friend that Jesus decided to speak to him and said, John, uh, I, my heart breaks because your heart is breaking over the loss of your friend. I, I want to give you a passage of scripture I want you to hold on to. It's the passage of scripture I often share with people who've experienced loss in their life. This is the word that specifically Jesus gave to John, the beloved disciple. He said, truly, truly, I say, you will weep and sorrow now, but your sorrow will be turned into joy. Why? Because I will see you again. I will see you. Others will see you again that have gone on before. will see you again. And when you see them, your hearts will rejoice at seeing those who've gone on before. And no one, no one will ever take that joy from you. That's the love that Jesus had for John, and John spoke in John had a special relationship with Jesus. And Jesus loved John in return. This is the account that John wrote. Early in the morning on the first day of the week, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb and she saw that the stone had been moved away from the entrance. She ran at once to Simon Peter and the other disciples. Simon Peter, the one who had denied Jesus three times. And the one that Jesus loved, who was John, gasping for breath, they took the master from the tomb, she said, and we don't know where they put him. And Peter and the other disciple, John, left immediately for the tomb, and they ran, a lot of running going on. They ran neck and neck, and the other disciple got to the tomb first, outrunning Peter. And stooping to look in, he saw the pieces of linen cloth lying there, but he didn't go in. Simon Peter arrived after him and entered the tomb, observed the linen cloths lying there, and the kerchief used to cover his head, not lying with the linen cloths, but separate, neatly folded by itself. And then the other disciple, the one who had gotten there first, went into the tomb and took a look at the evidence that he believed. And the disciples then went back home. But Mary stood outside the tomb, and she was weeping. Mary person of ill repute, she was there, and she was weeping over the love that she had for the Christ who had been crucified and had taken the body away. And she looked into the tomb and she saw two angels sitting there dressed in white, one at the head and the other at the foot where Jesus' body had been laid. And they said to her, woman, why do you weep? Mary replied, because they've taken my master and I don't know where they have put him. And after she said this, she turned away and saw Jesus standing there, but she didn't recognize him, maybe because of the tears or for some other reason, but she didn't recognize it was Jesus that she was actually talking to, the one that she was looking for. Thinking that he was the gardener, she said, Sir, if you took him, just tell me where you put him so I can go take care of him. A week ago, my wife and I went to Iowa City. We went to a bookstore downtown. Uh, Connie went to her section to look at books, and I went to my section to look at books, and we were there together. And all of a sudden, I said to the person who was with us, I don't know where Connie went to. Three floors of this bookstore, and I have no idea where she's at. And all of a sudden, I heard this. <coughs> and I said, that's Connie. I said, what? I said, that's Connie. I know her call. When you've been around someone for so long, you know them by a call, by a voice, by a speaking. You know what I mean? Sometimes when you love someone so much, even just their coughing, you know who they are by the sound that they make. That's one of the gifts that comes to us. <laughs> I know where she is. She's not lost. That's my wife, Connie. I love her. <laughs> Sir, if you took him, tell me where you put him so I can take care of him. And Jesus speaks one word. Mary. That's all he said. Mary. There's only one person that ever said that word to her like that. 
There's only one person that said that word to her when she found herself at the end of life and the odds of life itself, the Jesus who loved her. And he said it again, Mary. And turning to face him, she said in Hebrew, Rabboni, which means teacher. And she clung to him and Jesus said, don't cling to me for I've not yet ascended to the father, but go tell the brothers and tell them that I ascend to my father, your father, my God, your God. And Mary Magdalene was the first, <laughs> was the first who went and told the news to the disciples. And what did she say? I just saw Jesus, the master. And she told them everything that he'd said for her to tell. Let's join in singing that last verse. Every day to us is Easter with its resurrection song. When the cares of life overwhelm us, Easter people sing this song. In SAC, when we were talking, we said, what are we going to do to end up the service? We had some ideas. You'll hear about one of those a little bit later. But one of them we talked about was to have the kids come and tell us the story. What better thing? But then to relate to us the story of the resurrection. Now, I have to tell you, uh, we practiced, but in some ways, it's all going to be new. In some ways, we have no idea what's going to happen here. But we invite you to that unexpected journey and experience as we share, once again, the story of Jesus and Teresa, as she reads that story, and as our kids, well, we'll leave that up to them as they come. Come on, guys. Let's share your story with us.
but she didn't recognize him. Jesus spoke to her, Why are you weeping? Who are you looking for? She, thinking that he was the gardener, said, Sir, if you took him, tell me where you put him so I can care for him. Jesus said, Mary. Turning to face him, she said, Jesus, it's you. Jesus is alive. Mary went to tell the news to the disciples. I saw Jesus. Ta-da, he's alive. Yeah. Wait for you outside. Yeah. 